Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks a lot for the, for the introduction. Um, I, you know, so I, I, I do want to maybe, I don't usually start with this, but I would say just a, a couple words about myself also, um, which is that most of my work before this book, um, up till about 10 years ago, was on political economy um, of Russia and East Europe. And in fact, my next book is going to also be on political economy of Russia and East Europe. And I think at some point I'm going to have to combine these two interests and talk about the interaction between political economy and foreign policy. But I began working on this in a way um, uh, in about 2007 when I started teaching at Johns Hopkins Sites in DC. And it was right around the time of the Russo-Georgian War um, that really changed a lot of things geopolitically. I was working in a university that was very focused on foreign policy and international relations. Didn't have much interest in like what's going on domestically in these countries, but a lot more interest in kind of foreign policy relations in these countries. And so I feel actually during that time where I was teaching there, I sort of got a second PhD kind of in, in, in American foreign policy, as you see. EU foreign policy, and um, and I started teaching about this topic. And in a way, this um, this book represents the, you know like a, a decade of work. You know, a lot of which was done through teaching and preparation for teaching and teaching about the politics of a lot of different countries in the world. And um, uh, so I just thought I'd mention that as you know, kind of how I got interested and came around to, to this type of topic, um, which is of course you know great contemporary interests and, and, and particularly even this week, you know, and this this month, right, you know, we see the the sort of really, really tight relationship between American politics and Ukrainian politics, right? You know, or American politics and Russian politics, which is, you know, kind of the central theme, the central theme of the book is that um, that the geopolitical you know tensions between Russia and the West have really affected the politics of countries and the lands in between and these Politics of the lands in between have become uh, really important, not just in themselves, but also as, as sort of guide to understanding the confusing things that are happening in the West. Um, so um, in this talk, I'm going to try to uh, organize it. I meant to sort of sit a little bit sideways so I can see my own slides here. But I'm going to organize it by sort of asking a few different questions um, that I find are really important to sort of introduce the topic, which is, you know, a lot of people know that there's some sort of problem going on between Russia and the West, right? But I think a lot of times um, people don't totally pick up on, like, what is this conflict actually about? <laughs> like, a lot of, it, you'd be forgiven if you thought, it, sitting in the U.S., that it's all about the 2016 presidential election, right? But it's not. It's not. That's not really what it's about. And so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to argue that Russia is behaving in a very aggressive fashion. I'm going to also ask it why, why does it appear to be so angry, right? Why does Russia or the Kremlin appear to be so aggressive? I'll talk a little bit about the tools of hybrid war. I might, for time, de-emphasize that. How much time do we have, by the way? Uh, I think that if you spoke for 45 minutes. That would be okay, yeah. So we'll see. I'll, I'll try and get into that a little bit. Um, and then get to this question of, of how does all this affect ourselves? Like, how, how, why is this affecting, and how is this affecting politics? And just because I, I can't always be guaranteed to hold to like any particular time restriction <laughs> on my speaking, and uh, I will often go over. I've, I've decided over time that um, that the best strategy for me is to just tell you what I'm saying at the beginning, um, so that I don't um, lose that opportunity at the end. And so I'm just going to tell you more or less what I'm going to say today, which is that I believe that what's at stake in this conflict is that Russia is trying to replace or wants to replace the current institutions of European security with a different st structure um, that I will call sort of great power structure relations as opposed to a uh, sort of liberal institutional structure. Um, Russia is extremely, is taking very risky and aggressive actions towards the West because it feels existentially challenged. Um, the regime, especially the Putin regime, feels like it may not survive or, you know, a sort of um, conflict or, you know, an assault by liberal Western institutions, which is a whole thing which is hard for people in the West to understand, but I think it's interesting. Um, the, in terms of the tools of hybrid war, you'll notice that I put war in the title and hybrid war in the title. I mean, I think there's uh, a conflict that's going on presently 
which is being waged through a variety of different means, some of which are reasonably well understood in the West and others of which are not very well understood in the West. So I'll talk about that. And then, um, and then but the, the sort of key payoff as far as I see it in the book, and, and you may see it differently, but for me the key payoff is that that we learn a lot by studying the countries on the front line of this conflict in Eastern Europe, we learn a lot about ourselves. We learn a lot about what's going on here at home. And, um, and I'm going to argue that there's a certain style of politics that's been promoted by this conflict, which is um, a, one of polarization of the domestic political space and also the rise of power brokers who seek to actually benefit from the conflict in a way benefit from both sides of the conflict. Um, and, and that's a whole other sort of conceptual level of difficulty. Um, just just to, out of interest, I know the TAM students, like some of you are international and some of you are Americans, but so can I get a show of hands, like how many people are basically American, how many people are basically somewhere else? Who, who are the primarily American students? Or, and who are the sort of internationals? Or, yeah, so maybe 25% or so international. Okay, it's just helpful for me when I, because I, I'm going to sometimes talk about us or our as sort of American or whatever, so I don't want to miss it. Um, so, um, so let me start with what is at stake. And um, here I think actually it's interesting that, that, all, that it's hard to understand this conflict, but it's, hard, it, it, it's particularly hard when you don't understand what, what people are fighting about, right? And um, I think what's, I, th I take a pretty broad, expansive view of what is going on. This, this conflict is basically about European security. You may know, right, especially those of you who are European, that there have been two devastating wars in the last century in Europe, right? And that the United States was drawn into both of these wars, and therefore has had a really major role in European security um, since 1918, 1917. Um, that's about 100 years. And uh, is very invested in European security. Um, for those of you studying Europe, that's not a big surprise. But as you know, um, a lot of people don't really think about that anymore. So um, it's sort of so background that, that people aren't very interested in Europe right now. Um, but it remains the, the sort of fundamental security preoccupation in the United States. And, um, and we have, uh, after the Second World War, the United States, together with uh, European powers, constructed a set of institutional, a set of institutions that are supposed to guard the peace and, and make war, if, if not impossible, very, very unlikely in the European continent. And those institutions are twofold. They're basically NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the European Union itself, which although people talk about it as a sort of economic organization, which it is, the point of the EU is to prevent war. Right? It's to tie the different economies of the European Union together to such an extent that there isn't going to be conflict between those countries. Um, and Russia, I'll argue, wants a different, is unsatisfied for various reasons with this structure and wants a different, a different structure. Um, I'm just going to note here for time that there are also other issues going on. There's um, values issues that are different sorts of politics issues. Um, there's different economics going on. But I'm not going to emphasize those today, although I'd be happy to talk about them if you're interested. Um, I'm just going to focus on the sort of broader geopolitical context for, for right now. And the way I like to do this is um, with maps. Um, and I like maps because, uh, well, actually, I can't really say why I like maps. <laughs> but I just really do like maps. And um, I sit and look at maps a lot. I used to sit and look at maps a lot. And primarily, I think I would think about all the different places on the maps and try to imagine what was going on like in different spots on the maps. Right? And after a long time of doing that, I realized that um, maps, um, maps are really interesting because they tend to have, they tend to say a lot if you look at them for a long time, they tend to say a lot about the political imagination of the people who did the map, who drew the map, or designed the map. And um, that's what I'd like you to focus on right now, is this sort of political imagination. So if I were to ask you, what is this a map of, what would what would leap to mind? EU candidates? Yeah, this is a map of the EU, that's good, yeah. I think a lot of people would say the EU, or it's a map of Europe, right? Those would be probably the two, number two, Number one, number two. In this audience, you're you're more precise. So you're saying it's a map of you, which is good. Um, but I just like you to um, to see that um, from Russia's point of view, this type of vision of Europe, right, 
is not really very favorable towards Russia. Right? Because Russia is sort of outside the area that is of focus in this map. And I think that that point is, is even more salient when you look at this map, which is um, actually an official map of the European Union, right, of the Council of Europe. And it, um, it, it provides this vision of, as I would portray it, a kind of celebration of European nations. Every European nation gets a bright color. Every nation gets a bright um, flag on the side. But if you think about it from a Russian point of view, um, this is kind of a disturbing, potentially disturbing kind of map, right? Because Russia exists as a kind of like tan background to this European celebration of nations. The map that I actually love the most about the European Union is this one, which I think the author to me had to have been uh, West European, right, of this map. <laughs> um, and uh, what it does is this portrays a map of a multi, uh, a multi-level uh, Europe, uh, multi-tier Europe, I guess you'd say, where, I'm going to see if I can get this going, yeah, where you have a first tier of European countries. By the way, if you ask American students what countries are in Europe or where are they, like, these are the ones that they would know, most likely, right? And then there's a sort of second tier Europe, which is made up of the 2004 new member states of the European Union, a third tier Europe, which is made up of Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey. And then there's a fourth tier Europe, which is you know uh, Russia, et cetera, right? And so the point I want to make here is that from the Russian perspective, um, they don't really see themselves as fourth tier Europe, right? Um, or nor do they want to be a fourth tier kind of country in Europe. They would probably um, prefer to be seen as a first tier member of the European Union, and a first tier um, uh, country involved in European security, as the United States has you know, really substantial security interests in Europe, so does Russia, right? And, and, and Russia, moreover, is at the very least partly European uh, country. And so Russia's vision about its importance <coughs> in world affairs is more nearly, um, more nearly uh, reflected in this map of, of sort of imperial Europe um, of the, uh, I, don't, I didn't check, or it's got cut off here, what the year we're talking about here, but. Um, I guess this is 1818 or something. And, um, you know, the Russian Empire is a big European power in this map, arguably the biggest, you know, at least by size. Um, as, alongside other major countries in Europe, like the German well, Union, the Habsburg Empire, the Kingdom of Great Britain, Spain, France, uh, and the Ottoman Empire, it's one of the from a Russian perspective, Russia is one of the top four powers in Europe. And so the whole idea that Russia would somehow be relegated to fourth tier status in the European Union or outsider status in Europe is pretty intolerable, at least to the current regime in Moscow. And um, the vision that Russia has of, of what should replace, and this, by the way, comes not only just, is not my supposition, but it comes from an analysis of the proposals that Russia has made for reorienting European security. They don't want NATO to be around. They think NATO is obsolete and should be eliminated. And they would like to replace NATO um, with an organization which is similar to like the OSCE type organization. Um, and, and um, well, I'll back up on that, but just to say that the vision that Russia really has is a vision of great power um, Europe, where essentially Russia would have the, same, the rights that pertain to a great power and, um, and be able to, uh, and the way that this would work in Russia's conception is that European security would be oriented around a series of meetings very similar to the Congress of Vienna, um, which was a situation that was set up, uh, it was a, an, a treaty basically that was set up at the end of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. So when Napoleon invaded most of Europe, including Russia, in the eight, early 1800s. After the war, the, uh, the sort of conservative powers of Europe got together under um, Count von Metternich of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was the foreign minister of Austria-Hungary. Um, he set himself up and said, we're going to deal with these. We don't want permanent conflict in Europe. and We want to we deal with any security issues that arise through a kind of Congress, which meant a periodic conference of the top leaders 
to decide the fate of different European security matters. Now, what were those European security matters? Great idea. Um, but what were those matters? Those matters generally pertained to the rising desire of different European nations to have independence from these empires, generally speaking. Right? So the Italians would want to form their own nation state and, and have an uprising. And so the, these meetings would be, well, how do we deal with the Italian uprising? Who, who, who's going to conquer the Italians today? Um, how do we deal with the Poles are having an uprising? How do we conquer the Poles? And if, if one country is having difficulty managing those relations internally, they would often invite in other powers to, uh, to meet those challenges. For instance, in 1848, I don't know how many of you know European history. Presumably, all the ones who answered that they were European all know European history. Um, and uh, know about the history of 1848, but in 1848 was was the beginning of democratic movement essentially in Europe, or democratic uprisings anyway in Europe, that um, where there were democratic uprisings throughout Europe, and um, they were eventually put down by the conservative powers, often in co combination with other. So, for instance, the Russian army was sent into Budapest to uh, kill a student strike, uh, killing in a literal sense in this case a student strike that had been advocating for Hungarian you know, autonomy within Austro-Hungary and also uh, greater democratic and self-reliance principles or self-determination uh, principles. So um, for a lot, of his, a lot of historians and a lot of political scientists um, talk about the Congress Europe as a, as a significant success in a way. And um, it was a success within a 30-year at least period and in a way sort of continues up until the First World War. But from a European perspective, broadly speaking, correct me if I'm wrong if you're European, um, but broadly speaking, people feel that this whole, um, this whole uh, great power Europe sort of failed. And it failed sort of catastrophically a couple of times, right? It failed catastrophically uh, in the sense that it was not on the side of right, right? It wasn't on the side of democracy. It wasn't on the side of national self-independence, which most Europeans wanted. But it also, bless you, it also failed catastrophically with the outbreak of the First World War. Right, where basically um, it didn't really prevent the whole of Europe being immersed in an extremely deadly war. And so for this reason, I think the, um, the Russian desire to recreate and propose new versions of a great power Europe is fundamentally not interesting or not even understood by most people in the West. Uh, most people in the West look at this and say, how is this, a, how is this in any way better? Right, than the security system that we have now, right? To sort of rely on these great powers to like you know control our our fate, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, so and and let me just give you a, a different insight, perhaps, into the nature of the EU and NATO. If you think about it, both of these organizations um, are are kind of in a way brilliant in that in that they um, provide a lot of power to the great powers. Right, no doubt about that. Right, the United States has an outsized role in the, in NATO, and Germany, of course, has been accused, you know, rightly probably, of having a very substantial predominance within the European Union. At the same time, these organizations solve um, one of the fundamental problems of security in Europe, which is how to represent the small states. Because remember, it's always been the small states that have been the problem in European security. Right. The First World War broke out when a Serbian nationalist threw a bomb into the carriage of the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria and Hungary, setting off a series of alliances that, that caused this conflagration. And the Second World War was, was, was set off because of you know, the, the, the partition of Poland, you know, where the, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact basically said, we're going to, you know, Nazi Germany and Soviet Union are going to split Poland and cut it off. And it was then that, you know, that the war broke out. It was these territorial ambitions of the strong or the weak that have um, really been the source of conflict in Europe. And so as a result, what these institutions do in NATO and, and, and the EU is they give enormous representation to the small states. And I think that's very little understood um, by anybody, actually. But you're hearing it here now. And I'll tell you why this is. So if you think about it, in NATO, um, we always generally think, you know, a lot of Spaniards, for instance, will say, well, NATO is just like American imperialism, right? But the reality is in NATO, the biggest advantage goes to the smallest state in NATO, right? It's the Estonia who, if, if you think about it, it's an all-for-one, one-for-all sort of structure. So everybody has to commit to fighting if any one of the members is attacked. Well, who does that advantage more than the smallest state in 
right? Estonia, who, who never would be able to defend itself right, against the Russian invasion, gets the biggest benefit out of NATO because everybody is going to back up Estonia. Um, likewise, in the European Union, and maybe Mulata will, 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 uh, will accept or disagree with this, I don't know, we have to see, but the, you know, in the European Union, um, you know, there's an outsized proportion of representation given to the smaller states, right? Where I believe, and again, Mulata, you can tell me if I'm wrong, that the Visegrad states, which are the, you know, four states, I think, I don't know if to explain the Visegrad in this audience, but Visegrad states have more votes in total or similar votes in total to Germany itself. And so there's an overrepresentation in voting in the European Union of the smaller state, and also all the smaller states get represented at the at the uh, commission level as direct, director generals, right? So all the um, the cabinet, if you will, of the European Union is made up of one from each European state. So and also in all the jobs in the European Union. So so the the European Union gives very 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 substantial security for. Um, and advantages for small states as well as for, for large states. And that's the reason I think fundamentally that in the West, we just don't really get what Russia is talking about when it, when it argues for a great power here. Because basically that would be a huge loss of power for most of the states in Europe. Remember, uh, Europe is made up today of a lot of states, right? a lot of whom are pretty small, um, and a lot of whom would be challenged um, if all of a sudden you have a kind of great power. So this is another picture, I think, that encapsulates, sort of, for Russia, you know, the advantages of great power politics, right? Yalta, where um, where Russia could sit at a sort of equal equality with, you know, the United States and the UK and carve up Europe in the way that it, it prefers to do so. And obviously, part of that is having its own sphere of influence. So um, let me transfer over to what is um, the next question: was what does Russia want? You know, what are they trying to get at here? And you know the, the bottom line is they're trying to undermine European Union and NATO. They would like these organizations to either be disbanded or sharply diminished in their capacities. They frequently they want to split the United States from Europe um, to infiltrate political processes, um, uh, to elect pro-Russian leaders, and um, and to turn world public domain against the U.S. At the same time, they want to be a, a treated as a great power, which means having a seat at the table where all decisions are made, which they don't currently have, for instance, in NATO or the European Union type Europe. So this whole Euro structure of European institutions, which for the West is seen as fundamentally good and, and as productive of peace, for Russia doesn't seem uh, like it could be. Um, I might go through this, or I might sort of leave this a little bit. Um, I think I'm just going to leave this by the wayside just talking about the academic approaches to this issue. But just to say a couple things that there's there's a big debate in academia about what are the reasons that we ended up in a conflict with Russia. And um, there are three, as I see it, three basic perspectives. One is that Putin, like Putin's evil or Putin's bad guy somehow, or has these views that, that are different and that, that are very conflictual. Another is kind of that this is the deep history of Russia with Western relations, that Russia is very often in conflict with the West, and it's not a really big surprise given the historical trajectories. And the third is that, um, that Russia was sort of pushed by the West, that the West provoked Russia by um, expanding NATO and the European Union um, up to the borders of Russia, including some of the post-Soviet states, and that uh, this is kind of a reaction that whether it was Putin or somebody else, they were bound to react against the diminishment of their own sort of sphere of influence, essentially. Um, I don't really disagree that much with all of any of these. I also don't think that any of them is very easy to prove um, as a scientific matter. I think they're good hypotheses on all sides. But I tend to be in the Putin camp myself. I tend to think that a lot of this, not denying that there's a deeper history, but a lot of this had to do with the fact that Putin came to power and he had certain preferences. And now we're seeing kind of what those preferences are. Um, but we can go back to that again later. The, the, um, the further point I'm trying to get to is sort of, you know, understanding, like, you know, it, it, it's one thing to understand that Russia would be unhappy, right? Um, and, you know, we're unhappy with a lot of things. Like, everybody's unhappy with all sorts of things, right? You know, but there's a big difference between being unhappy and going out and provoking a sort of war over these things, or, or sort of attacking your opponents to the extent that um, that Russia has been, uh, been you know, involved in. 
And I think that you have to, the, the key thing, you know, I've talked about from the Russian perspective in a way how Russia has failed to understand how the EU and Europe sees its own security. But there's also a lot of misunderstandings on the Western side, and I think one of the big misunderstandings is that people have failed to understand how existentially threatened Russia could feel by a peace organization. So the big gap, I think, for, for Western, one of the big gaps for Western understanding is that nobody gets in the EU or the US why Russia would feel existentially challenged by, I think Malata actually said, called the EU once, one of the biggest peacemaking organizations or democracy promoting organizations, right? But you could equally well call it one of the biggest peacemaking organizations in the world, right? Most successful in the world. <clears throat> and in fact, the EU um, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012, right? Um, which further cemented this vision in Europe of, of, of EU, which was its original purpose as a peacemaking body. And so it's hard for us, I think, to understand that for Russia, um, they would see the EU as a threat. Not only as a threat, but as a potentially existential threat um, to their government. And the reason they would see it as a threat is that um, this democratization support, which seems so benign, for, for Europeans, in fact, is an important underlying, you know, um, strategy of the European Union to sort of promote democracy because democracies don't fight against each other and will more willingly organize things. All that's great, except if you think that democracy is a fundamental threat to your own regime, right? If you're worried, as Putin is worried, that um, one of the ways that he might end up being deposed would be through a democratic protest. All of a sudden, this pro-democracy sort of thing looks like an existential threat. Okay? It looks like a direct challenge. So in other words, if democracy spreads to Ukraine, um, it makes it more probable that um, a democracy uh, demands would start breaking out in Moscow as well. And therefore, uh, you have to you know, see democratization kind of anywhere in the first Soviet space as a, as a relevant existential threat to Russia itself. Um, as well as, and I, I'm not going through these other areas quite as much, but I could talk about them too, but let me just mention in economic space, if, if Russia is kind of a mafia state type organization with a sort of patronal relations and, um, you know, very, very much top down, you know, pyramidal structure, that type of economy doesn't really interact and mesh very well with the sort of market oriented sort of European economy, right? They sort of mutually undermine each other. So one could also see Russia's economic success as being potentially undermined. By, by these things as well. Um, all right, so I'm going to get through in record time today, which is good because I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, but I'm going to keep roaring ahead. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the uh, methods. So the other thing I think that's really confusing to people in the West about the conflict that we're in, and the reason, by the way, that most people I speak to, I suspect, don't really think that we're in a conflict with Russia. <laughs> I think people maybe often invite me to, to talk about this conflict in Russia because they're not sure if it's real, right, generally speaking. I think it's real, you know, but half the people I speak to probably don't think it's real. But, uh, you know, and, and part of it is because of the way it's, it's fought, right? That this conflict we're in is not directly military conflict for the most part, okay? There are military dimensions to it, but for the most part, it's being fought by these hybrid so-called or, or political techniques, um, such as information warfare, which a lot of people wouldn't agree is warfare, such as disinformation, <coughs> underlying trust, uh, fra issue framing, also computer hacking. I mean, it's obvious that, that Re I think to everybody that Russia penetrated various servers, not only the Democratic server, but possibly also the Republican server, and also some European servers, including the um, including the German parliament, uh, the Bundestag was uh, subject to attack. Um, uh, Emmanuel Macron's emails were all dumped on the, um, on the you know, doorstep of the, the election, last election in France. I mean, this is a frequent technique. Um, and um, because the Mueller report, which is available to everybody, by the way, it's a very interesting thing to read, and it's not longer than a book. Like, for instance, um, <laughs> it is, uh, it is a, a worthwhile sort of thing to read. Um, that's the first time I've ever gotten a call from somebody who self identifies as telemarketer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so because all this is detailed in the Mueller report, and because um, the Mueller report in its context has been massively discussed in the 
idea, and I suspect that everybody's heard at least something about this, if not actually read the Miller Report, which is, by the way, a good idea. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I'm, I'm going to mention um, some of the other ways that I think have been not emphasized sufficiently in the public debate that um, this uh, conflict is going on. So one thing is the issue of party finance, and this is very tricky to talk about. It's actually the first thing I ever published on this topic was about party finance, but it's interestingly been the last thing that's actually been investigated by anybody, or the investigation has been revealed by anybody. Um, Russia has a, a pretty strong pattern that emerges across multiple countries of financing various parties, political parties, in Europe and in, in North America. Um, including, um, you know, we don't have that much direct evidence because a lot of this can happen in, in various sort of th ways that are meant to avoid, you know, like being publicized, right? But there is some some evidence. Uh, for instance, in WikiLeaks, uh, there was a, a U.S. State Department cable that showed that the U.S. State Department was tracking uh, Russian efforts to finance the Ataka Party, which is a sort of um, far right, I believe, um, uh, uh, political party in Bulgaria. Um, the one public thing that did occur is that we found that uh, Russia was financing the FLN, the uh, Marine Le Pen's party in France, which is the far left, far right party in France. Um, and um, there, there was also pretty strong evidence, I would say, in Hungary that Russia funded the Jobbik party, um, which is the far right party that emerged in, uh, in Hungary in the 2000s. The evidence there is kind of interesting. I wrote an article about that in Foreign Affairs. The, a guy who became uh, treasurer of Jobbik and had these magnificent fundraising success was a very clearly um, a, an FSB agent. He was somebody who was a businessman who had spent most of his career in Russia, then returned to Hungary. Uh, his wife, it turned out, was very obviously an FSB operative. It turned out when journalists looked into it further, she had two other husbands, uh, one of whom was a, a Japanese nuclear scientist and the other was a uh, Vietnamese uh, mob boss. Um, and um, she was presumably working as a courier for, for the FSB, et cetera. So uh, he's still, I think, in the, in the European Parliament, by the way. He was investigated, but not, nothing really was done about him. But, um, but in any case, we see, uh, and then, there, of course, there's, there's um, rumors, insinuations, investigations, obviously touching the UK and the US, um, probably as well as many other countries, um, most of which, interestingly, haven't really been published <laughs> very much. So, for instance, we know that um, the Federal Election Commission in the U.S. Um, started a big investigation to some $30 million that's reputed to have gone from Russian uh, oligarchs and, and probably government agents to um, the National Rifle Association in the United States. However, the, the Federal Election Commission is sort of hung up on various issues. It's very, it's not bipartisan anymore. It's, it's basically ineffective at the moment. So that investigation has never really come to fruition. But I think there's really strong evidence of this. Um, just for instance, the, the um, Alexander Torshin, who is the handler of Marina Putina, who was just sent back to Moscow last week, he was photographed at an NRA meeting wearing the yellow jacket of million dollar donors to the NRA. Um, and and I, I personally believe that um, a further investigation of that, if it ever happens in the United States, will show that tens of millions of dollars from Russia were funneled through a variety of different channels into the US election in 2016. Um, including the NRA, and what that means is that the NRA, as you probably know, it, it funds a lot of people. It definitely donated the biggest ever donation in its history to the Donald Trump campaign, that money obviously coming from Russia in my opinion, but it also funded pretty much every Republican GOP um, campaign as well. And I think that's a big reason why um, the GOP was very, very reluctant to investigate, um, to investigate, it, well, not in favor of the Mueller investigation, not in favor of any investigations in the House Intelligence Committee, et cetera, about Russia is because pretty much, whether they knowingly or unknowingly, and I suspect that probably only a small group of, of GOP people knew about it um, at the time, pretty much all the GOP was getting Russian money during the 2016 election. And that was just deemed as like way too embarrassing um, for anybody to, to release that. So that's my, my assumption about that. Another, I've also been following this issue very closely in Britain, and Britain in, any, in many ways is worse than the United States in the sense that um, there were huge allegations of Russian money coming into the Leave campaign um, in Britain. Um, the biggest donor, the biggest actually ever political donation in UK history was given by a guy who doesn't appear to have very much money, 
um, this guy Aaron Banks, um, who has a small insurance company, um, and uh, he gave this huge donation to the Leave campaign. And we also know that, like again from very public sources, that at the same time during the campaign, he had lunch multiple times with the Russian ambassador um, and Nigel Farage, um, and that he was offered a gold mine or a share in a gold mine in Russia during the campaign. Right, but this guy, these are things that are public out there knowledge. Interestingly, the British government or the parliament um, investigated all these issues in the Intelligence and Security uh, uh, Committee in Parliament, but then never published the report. And just yesterday, I can report to you that um, that Dominic Grieve, who I believe he was, was he Home Secretary in the last, in the Theresa May government? But he was a, a he's on the Tory side. He a, was a minister, I'm pretty sure he was Home Secretary, maybe he was for, even Foreign Secretary for a bit. He announced publicly yesterday that, um, that, the, that the Tory government has been sitting on this report and that it alleges a very substantial Russian intervention in you know, financing, basically, of, of the Leave campaign. He doesn't say, use those words exactly. He says Russian intervention in the elections uh, in Britain. Um, so, uh, so I think that what's going to come out over the next several years, eventually, um, when the governments that have not been elected with this money come to power, um, is that uh, we're going to find a lot about that. And that's going to be central. And I, and I think it is, you know, the reason I think it's central is because, you know, in all these other cases, we see it central. Like, you see it being central in other cases like France. Um, so maybe that's a lot about that. But I, I guess one more thing. So I mentioned it was the first thing that I wrote about. So the first article I actually wrote or published about this stuff was in 2014 when I when I published an article in Foreign Affairs saying that Russia had become the number one financer of far right, basically, and Nazi parties, you know, in, in Europe. Right? Um, and at the time, that was like kind of a like head turner, and then it became sort of like I think accepted wisdom, you know, pretty much within a couple of years. Right? Um, and um, that article remains of my foreign affairs articles, like my most cited article. <laughs> Although at the time I felt like I was walking out on a limb on that one, but that turned out to be okay. The, um, the, another article that I've written more of an academic character is on uh, Russia's attempts to use um, Trojan horses within the EU and NATO institutions. So trying to recruit governments that are within the NATO, within the European Union, to sort of articulate Russian positions within those bodies in a way to sort of um, reduce their importance or make them or make politics more contentious within them or to debilitate the organizations. And um, I mentioned that most of these techniques, so most of these techniques are kind of like subterfuge, right? And therefore they're designed not to get as much attention as they as they should. And they don't get as much attention as they should as a result. People don't like to uh, broadcast their cooperation with these sorts of things. Um, and there's always like a question of a doubt that, of course, people are very willing to mine. But um, but there is also the reason you know some when I was looking at the terms to use hybrid war, other terms to use for this warfare. I mean, you know, one of the pieces of it is is it all just information warfare, or is there a military dimension to it too? And the, the, the reality is there is a military dimension to this too. So that. Um, Russia has engaged in a policy, which is actually an open policy, of conducting targeted assassinations in Western states. The most famous of which was the Skripal case, right, where um, there was a former Russian spy who had been traded in a spy swap. He was living in Salisbury in the UK. This was a couple of years ago, and he was um, there was an assassination attempt, which was sort of transparently run by the FSB because they got these people on tape and they were able to match them back to various things. But anyway. The mechanism that they used was very unusual. They actually used a VX nerve agent, which is a highly classified and very dangerous, uh, you know, chemical weapon, essentially. And they, the and it was interesting they used this in an assassination attempt on British soil. Right? And and you know you have to ask yourself, well, why would you do that? You know, if you wanted somebody dead, first of all, there was a, a sure method because the guy, by the way, didn't die eventually. He, he, he and his daughter had this nerve agent spread on their front door. They touched it, became very sick, but they didn't actually die. The people who died was actually the, the agents tossed um, the bottle that contained this, which was in a perfume bottle, in, into a British park. And somebody came by, sprayed the perfume on their hand, and died. Um, but it was really, in a way, to send a message, right? It was the first ever sort of chemical weapons attack, you know, in Western soil, you know, in, in the UK. Um, and it was it was sort of uh, saying, you know, it was in a way meant to deliver a message that. 
um, you know, we have chemical weapons and we're willing to use these chemical weapons against you. Um, likewise, um, Russia has, uh, President Putin has gone very publicly to sort of talk about hypersonic nuclear weapons that he has. Uh, how many people, by the way, have heard about that? The hypersonic nuclear weapons. It's interesting that it didn't really get very much resonance in the U.S., which I think is interesting. I'll talk about that more later. But he made a whole big show um, at the Kremlin of this big press conference where he introduced, like, Russia has, like, a whole bunch of new nuclear weapons that can reach major targets in the U.S. within a matter of hours. And they saw that as a sort of answer to anti-missile defenses that the U.S. have in Europe, um, that you know it's not going to prevent your major cities from being blown up in a nuclear strike because we can just sail a, a submarine over to Houston and like blow up all the major U.S. cities within a couple of hour, you know, a couple of minutes, basically. Um, and um, so I, there's been a huge amount of sort of nuclear sailor rattling and sort of threats that have been there, as well as overflights of NATO territory, you know, penetration of Russian jets into British and even U U.S. territory, and also particularly in the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, um, that are in fact kind of, uh, you know, you could call them, they were, they're not really, they fall below the level of what you'd say is a, an attack on some other state. However, they're kind of attacks <laughs> that are going on. Um, so that's the nature of the kind of conflict that, that we have. now. How is the West responding? So the West is not totally innocent here, of course, um, and the West has um, has in fact been engaged in conflict as well, but with a delay. What's interesting about the Western response is because we didn't really realize what was going on or see what was going on um, very early, we tended not to react very much um, and tended not to notice that anything was happening until about five years after it happened. <laughs> I think that Russia was engaging in these activities from at least 2007, some would say before. But the West didn't really react in any way until 2012, and particularly after the Crimea conflict in 2014, when essentially we placed economic sanctions on Russia. Uh, these economic sanctions, a lot of debate about them, people have said a lot of different things about them, most of which is you know, kind of garbage to my mind, but the bottom line of these sanctions is they are extremely harmful to Russia, and that Russia is desperate to get rid of these sanctions. Um, and I think one evidence of that is that you can see in the, in the discussions that Michael Flynn had, you know, around the time of Trump's election, all the, you know, what he was talking about with Russia was dropping the sanctions, that was what it was about. Um, because of that, the U.S. Congress passed by a massive uh, majority of Democrats and Republicans that uh, this CATSA legislation, which made it impossible for Donald Trump to get rid of sanctions. Um, the worry was, I think the worry both on the Democrat and Republican side is that Trump was engaging in some sort of quid pro quo with the Russians about dropping sanctions in exchange for who knows what, and, um, and that this was not good for U.S. policy, so they made it that a, that a congressional vote was needed in order to drop um, most of these Russia sanctions, which have damaged the Russian economy, put them into recession for three years. They're now coming out of it, but they're still in a pretty low growth um, situation. So the Russian attempt has been covert methods, which are very good at, and um, nuclear saber rattling, right, the threats. And the Western way of fighting this conflict has been largely through economic means, because the West has enormous preponderance of economic strength. Russia is very weak in this area, and they really are unable to respond um, to do anything that would harm our economies. They can't respond with oil and gas cutoffs because that's how they make all their money. 50% of Russia's exports is oil and gas. They're not going to cut off oil and gas to the West, whatever anybody thinks. And um, the only thing they were able to do is ban uh, the import of European food items. So now in Russia, you can't buy, um, you can't buy uh, Scottish salmon. You can't buy Norwegian salmon, you can't buy French cheese, or you can't buy Italian wine. So all they're doing is hurting themselves. Um, the result of this, however, has not been perhaps what anybody wanted. It's that um, it's that uh, that the, the conflict is only deepened, right? So as Russia has behaved aggressively, the West has responded, I think, effectively after quite a long delay with economic sanctions. It's only made things worse, right? The, the conflict is only getting deeper and deeper. I think you see the you know, 2016 election was obviously a very aggressive act. Uh, we're going to see what's going to happen next. Um, but tensions seem to be rising, and it particularly has affected, I would argue, the what I call the lands in between, those states that lie in between the European Union.
And I think what's interesting in looking at them is, is that you can see how the politics have emerged. Like, what, what have been the political reactions of these states? Like, how, how has it affected or shaped their politics? And I do that because I think they're the sort of canaries in the coal mine. They're the ones who are most affected by the conflict. They're the frontline states. And you start to see patterns that are visible there that, once you think about it, are visible here too, but you wouldn't necessarily notice it. Um, and so I think that's the way I talk about it. This book is really not a book um, so much for East Europeans, although a lot of East Europeans maybe have acted like it's more for them than, than Americans have. But there's really a book written more for a Western audience of sort of how can we learn from the lands in between about things that are shaping our own politics. And um, I don't want to skip anything important, but I want to end pretty quick. So I'm just going to say um, the two parts of this, a very simple two part argument. One, on the one hand, um, Geopolitics and confrontation has polarized countries. So countries like Ukraine or Moldova, um, you know, maybe even Belarus, are polarized. You know, pretty much into those groups that want EU, uh, see an EU future for their country, and those that want to remain, you know, tightly coupled with a kind of you know Russian imperial sort of situation. And um, and there's not really a lot of like there's no place in between those two things. It's, very polarizing. Oftentimes, people talk about it in the context of civilizational choice, right? That you have to choose whether to join Western civilization or Eastern civilization, and that and that and and parties generally define themselves as like I'm the pro-EU party, I'm the pro-Russia party, or right? easily defined by others. Like this. Um, but paradoxically, in this situation, I think this is another aspect of the argument that I think is very hard to understand, particularly for Westerners is that um, when you have this sharp division in politics, it actually raises the importance of, of bridgers, of, pe of people who are not ideological power brokers, who, um, who find ways of, who basically benefit from the conflict by, um, by elevating themselves and their own political vision by basically being on both sides of the conflict. Right? By basically being pro-European and pro-Russian at the same time. Now that's sort of mind bending in a in a country where on Sundays a lot of people sit in front of the TV and root for one football team or another football team. It's very very hard to imagine that there are people rooting for both football teams. Right? Um, it's it's very against in a way a, a lot of cultural aspects of the way Americans think about the world. I think, but I think that's the piece that we have to start to understand if we're going to get what's not only going on in these lands in between, but increasingly what's going on. So I'm going to give you, argue through a couple examples. Um, I'm just going to give two. I have a bunch of others I could talk about. And the book largely sort of shows a lot of the different strategies that these people use. But I'm just going to talk through a couple of them. And, and Orban, by the way, is not really in the lands in between. This isn't Central Europe. This isn't a country which is embedded in the EU. But you see this kind of dual dynamic really clearly, I think, with him. So I want to use that as an example. That you know, Orban is definitely very pro -food. Right. I mean, he's visibly pro-Putin. It's not a huge mystery. He's had several meetings. In fact, last week he was just had a summit meeting. And um, and and he has uh, basically made a couple big energy deals with Russia. Uh, Russia is building a nuclear power plant in in Hungary, and also is trying to prop up Hungary as like kind of hub for the South Stream or now it's called Turkish Stream uh, pipeline. And those are big lucrative deals for Hungary. Um, they probably put some money into a slush fund for Orban as well. He's very happy with them. And he runs around in Europe articulating, you know, we need to have a better relationship with Russia. He, by the way, also is, attacks Ukraine, you know, on the basis of the small Hungarian minority in Ukraine. And so he echoes Russian criticisms of Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. You would think, right, one, that, that this closeness, this closeness with Putin brings money to Hungary, to his pockets probably. Um, and you would think it would bring a program in the EU, but actually, in a lot of ways, it's actually strengthened Orban's position in the EU. Because being somebody who's a potential defector from the EU camp, who might bring Hungary outside the EU, has been embraced even further in the EU and given more support, if anything, um, than because of his relationship with Russia. So Hung Hung Orban, as you know, is not a Democrat. He's basically put, put in place an authoritarian regime which is highly criticized in the European Union. But the EU is very willing to, to is more willing, I would argue, to tolerate him because they see him as a potential defector of Russia. And the embrace that the EU has given him of not really criticizing his policies, he's now 
an important member of the EU uh, People's Party, the biggest party in the European Union, um, and has been protected uh, by Angela Merkel and protected by, um, by people in, in her party, um, even elevated in certain ways, is because partly that they're worried about um, this relationship he has with Russia. So this is just one strategy. You could call it the squeaky wheel strategy. That where where you could actually be uh, disloyal and embraced by the people you're being disloyal to at the same time. And what that means is more flow of funds into Orban's pockets and a greater ability to uh, succeed at whatever domestic needs. <clears throat> My favorite of all time and um, uh, strategy, and all these strategies are a little bit different. But my favorite of all time strategy is this guy Vladimir Plahanyuk, the biggest oligarch in Moldova, whose strategy was really amazing. He um, he had a background as a, basically a mob boss, a mafioso, probably made his money in human trafficking, and then wanted to become get a better reputation. And he decided to launch, he decided to become a pro EU politician in Moldova and launch into, and basically over time built up his party, which is called, funnily enough, the Democratic Party, although it's a very thuggish, you know, sort of a Democratic Party, built it up into the most successful um, Democratic pro-EU party in Moldova. Um, because of his past, he probably realized that it wasn't going to be very easy for him to sell himself in the West as, like, a nice guy and a friend. And he, he sort of, in a way, stopped trying. He said, well, look, I'm not a nice guy, but... If you want the pro-EU thing to happen, it's going to happen because of me, and therefore you have to support me. Interestingly, at the same time, he was also a big supporter of the pro-Russia party in Moldova, in part because if they didn't have a big pro-Russia threat in Moldova, who would support him to be the pro-EU guy? Right? Brilliant maneuver. And, and the same thing can be seen in his business dealings. On the one hand, he's seen as being the biggest beneficiary of a lot of EU funding into Moldova, various projects that he skims off of. On the other hand, he also, in his legitimate businesses, which he has both legitimate and illegitimate businesses probably, he owns two of the major television stations whose job, who's basically rebroadcast all of the Russian TV stand state, the major Russian TV stations in Moldova, including all of the Russian propaganda into Moldova. And he's paid for this, right? So he's getting money to broad rebroadcast Russian propaganda, and he's getting money to support uh, EU membership in Moldova. In his case, um, this sort of dual strategy backfired, which I think is interesting because it kind of shows some of the dangers of the strategy. Because Putin got wind of this and basically told the pro-Russia party, with whom he was planned, supposed to ally after the election, not to go into a coalition with him. And he ended up on the outs, and he went into exile. Guess where? Hmm? Russia. No, Miami. Yeah. <laughs> which is, I think, uh, just like the cherry on the cake here, you know, because, um, you know, again, about how the how complicit the West is in a lot of ways in these strategies, right? And and even though, you know, I mean, if it, I suppose he could have gone a lot of places, but but the fact that he was led into the U.S. I think was basically a way to get him out of Moldova, which is probably sort of legitimate. But it just sort of showed again how these people can be useful in various ways to both sides, you know, in the conflict. Now, turning to U.S. politics, and I want to really end quickly because I know I've already gone over. But I, I want to say that, that I think this is a great lens to understand Donald Trump as president. Because a lot of people have argued that Donald Trump is a Russian agent, um, that, that he always presents a Russian perspective. You know, and, and there's a certain amount of considerable evidence on that side, I would have to say. But at the same time, if you look at that conversation that he had with Zelensky in July, right? what is the conversation about? He's basically offering to give Ukraine anti-tank weapons that they will shoot at Russia, who's his supposedly best friends, right? In exchange for dirt on his opponent in 2020. Which says to me, again, that this is somebody who is, like the lands in between, um, a balancer, right? He's somebody who, one day he can be friends with Russia, the next day he'll be friends with their mortal opponent of Russia, as long as they're both donating to him um, personally. So I think that this perspective in the lands in between does give us an enormous ability to understand things, weird and bizarre trends that seem to be happening in our own countries. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. I, I was, of course, you know, there are a lot of reasons, but I, it just came to me after teaching for so long about this kind of weird, you know, sort of balancing that was going on in the lands in between and all the political problems that actually this might actually shed some light on processes that were happening in the West as well.
and that's that's really why, why I decided to write that. So thanks so much for your attention. Sorry I went over a bit, um, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.